So today I wanted to take a little bit different approach because I think as we've um, starting to kind of get into maybe perhaps Ebola fatigue, um, we wanted to really drive home a little bit about the infrastructure and really think about this on a more broad brush perspective as far as how we go ahead and plan for um, the highly infectious disease patient and whether that's somebody with CRE in your organization or it's somebody perhaps that you're ruling in or ruling out for certain things or maybe even just perhaps from a standpoint of having a really bad flu season. So I wanted to just say I have no financial relationships. And here are the objectives that I'd like to cover today. Do we have any emergency management folks in the audience? A few? Okay, so that's one of my hats that I wear too. So I'm always thinking about how do I apply what I'm doing back to the basics of the incident command structure and how we use that. So today what I'd like to do is describe kind of the all hazards approach that we've used uh, in the plan for the care of the highly infectious disease patient. I think all of this uh, perfectly applies to pandemic planning as well. Understanding how that hospital incident command system structure can be used in that um, work to, to really focus on how we do that and care for those highly infectious disease patients that may surge into our organization. Describe the required elements of preparedness to effectively respond to do that care and the key elements necessary to really sustain readiness. And I think that's one of the things too that as we've traveled across the country via NETEC, uh, we really drive home a lot and I know we have a breakout today about sustaining readiness and how do you do that and keep people engaged for the long term to uh, really do the right thing and be very responsive to what we're trying to continue to uh, make sure that we have in place. And then really I wanted to just touch base again. Uh, I know Dr. Uh, Parks did a nice job with the slide at the beginning about NETEC, but really talking about our role and responsibility of kind of building that national resilience to successfully continue to be able to handle and um, be prepared for the influx of infectious disease patients if that sh should occur. So we've been doing this a long time, and I tried to drive that home over the last couple of days as you're all like really working as hard as you can that, you know, both us and Emory uh, have had quite a long time to be prepared. So there's a lot of things that we've learned over that time, and we're really trying to exponentially increase um, that speed of play for you all by hopefully helping you with some resources and information uh, as we move forward. So this is just a quote that I really like. So this is just a picture structure of our uh, biocontainment unit. I won't spend too much time on it. It is five rooms, uh, so 10 beds is what we uh, have in the space. Uh, if we had 10 patients, that would be very tight. We did do a drill in J uh, January uh, with an influx of 10 uh, MERS patients uh, type scenario, and that certainly gave us a whole lot of learnings. And this is a cycle of learning, again, as we talk about emergency preparedness and how we're uh, constantly trying to figure out what's next and how do we um, keep fine-tuning things, whether that's related to a protocol or a process or just general workflow related things. So um, this will be in your packet, but it just gives you a nice visual of kind of our layout. And as we talked yesterday and the day before with you all, everybody's design and layout for where you would place patients um, is a little bit different. So that's gonna really drive what your resources and your uh, protocols and procedures and your staffing model is gonna look like. So. Um, It'll all be just a little bit different based upon where you're at, but the fundamental guiding principles will remain. Very busy slide, won't spend much time on it, but I think this was really one of the things that our, a couple of our staff did uh, for a nursing conference, and they really wanted to just drive home all the interconnectedness of both in your organization as well as with public health, with various agencies, and all the players it takes to really come together to um, operationalize care of a highly infectious disease patient or patients. Um, so it's just really significant as far as um, the number of people involved and the number of uh, players that, that all need to have um, a stake in helping. This should look familiar to most of you, and I know it's pretty small, but this is the hospital incident command structure, and that's what I'm really gonna organize my talk today about, 
and around um, what each of the different divisions within the Hicks structure would be accountable for if you apply that in an all-hazards approach to uh, care of a, a group of highly infectious disease patients. So, of course, anytime you have an incident, you have an incident commander. So this was no different for us when we activated. We did use our command structure. It was a modified smaller group of individuals who helped to lead and guide us through that period of time. And these are all colleagues of mine, and we all share incident commander admin on call um, and rotate that on a 10-week schedule. So. Uh, the incident commander, when you think about infectious disease, would be really responsible for kind of just overseeing kind of the general flow of things, pulling people together on a routine basis to um, check in in that periods of time that you might find necessary. Of course, it'll be a lot more frequent to begin with. And then as things kind of smooth out, depending upon um, all the moving parts, uh, that can be a little bit less often. Uh, this person would help me when we activated to get our activation checklist uh, completed, and I'll talk a little bit about that with you as I get to a slide related to kind of sustaining readiness. They also were helpful to uh, Dr. Lowe and I and the team as we were coordinating uh, transport logistics and helping us to notify players if uh, times moved up related to transport. Uh, in the command center, um, obvious for this type of a situation, your infectious disease clinicians would be your medical technical specialists. So if you had a chemical event, it might be your toxicologist. Um, obviously, it'll be different based upon what the scenario is. Um, in, a, in a major mass casualty incident, it would be a different type of a physician leader, probably a surgeon. Um, trying to help with any kind of decision making related to command structure. Identifying campus mitigation strategies, so um, say it was a pandemic type event with large numbers of individuals, uh, this individual would help decide are we going to lock down, um, how are we going to organize our safety structures within our uh, organization really working to collaborate when I think about all the communication that we had with CDC colleagues and other national agencies during um, activation. So there will be the need for us to make sure that you have some sort of person or go-to person that can help coordinate that. We talked a little bit about the planning cycle and how often would you need to get together and that's all going to be driven by what the incident is that's happening. And then one of the other things that we found very helpful was to really assign somebody in our, um, we had a, our vice chancellor of uh, clinical research became accountable to really work through with the FDA and others on experimental drugs. So depending on what the event is and what the, the um, pathogen is, that might be an important uh, go-to person as well. So you can kind of see then how your command structure is really then able to uh, be applied to a surge of infectious disease patients. So if I continue kind of down that path, you're a public information officer, and I can't say uh, enough about how important this was during activation. And certainly if you've got a lot of uh, moving parts, a lot of social media happening out there, I mean, the speed of play these days with people kind of filling the void with uh, coming up with things that perhaps are not exactly true. Um, so really having your spokespeople who are going to be the go-to's that'll um, be able to concretely speak to what it is from an infectious disease perspective, allay anxiety, collaborate with your public health folks. Um, we worked really hard to make sure that as we were sharing information, whether that was a press release or um, even doing press conferences, that we had our public health uh, folks in that loop reviewing those messages, assuring, because the last thing you want to do is have your community feeling as though they're getting one uh, direction here and one direction here. So um, identifying what those messages were going to be collaboratively was important. We worked really hard with our public health department also to set up an information line, and that really helped to uh, answer a lot of those questions coming from the public and they would then offer um, and call us to clarify if they didn't really have a formal answer on something, and then we would make sure that they had exactly what they needed to be able to share back. Um, we had kind of a, two different roles. One was an internal 
public information officer that really kind of did the internal messaging and we were very careful and clear about making sure our internal staff had that information before um, we put it out uh, externally. So again, it was just sort of valuing the fact that our internal folks um, really should have that information before uh, others did so that you can mitigate um, curiosity and questions and all that kind of thing. And then we also had a public information officer who was focusing externally. And I think we can all be clear about social media and how um, that can kind of just take on a life of its own. So uh, we had our PIO actually sat in our command center and there was not anything that was happening out there that uh, got too far out there before he got the answer and clarified um, exactly what was going on. So we worked hard to be very transparent, which in this day and age is pretty much what um, you need to do to make sure that you're building trust um, because when you have periods of long time with no um, clarity as far as what's going on, then people tend to uh, think you're hiding things. And it just seemed to really, really work well for us to have that kind of a model. So again, if you think about this in relationship to even just a single patient at a time was overwhelming, just think about if you had something uh, on a much more broader scale and what kind of resources you would need for that. So a lot of preemptive conversation was done with our PIO folks and over the, the years, uh, they were able to um, use some materials that they had from being in our organization uh, during drills and things like that. As we talked over the last couple of days, that's one thing I would really encourage you all to do is as you uh, do drills, you might consider even inviting, um, maybe for a part of the drill, not the whole drill, but a part of the drill, and really engaging your, your media folks on what it is that you're trying to do and what you're providing for your community. And that way it's not much of a surprise when you step up when something happens and they know that you're there and it just kind of uh, fulfills the the void of uh, all of that questioning. So proceeding then in the hospital incident command structure, you have the operations section, which is really the group that kind of carries out the strategy and the tactics and the objectives that are defined by the incident command group. So when I think about this in a pandemic world or in uh, our case of uh, caring for uh, patients with Ebola virus disease, you think about your surge plan. So I think we all can relate to the fact that we have negative pressure rooms in our organizations, but they're all kind of here, 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 here. So obviously if you have a large scale event, some of the capability of your infrastructure is going to have to just, you know, be what it is and you're just going to have to really figure out, are you going to be putting them all in one place? Um, in one unit so that you can try to mitigate and really focus your attention on assuring that you can uh, do PPE correctly and kind of all of that or will you be splitting people up. So all of those things should be really thought through um, ahead of time. And then your just-in-time personal protective equipment training, uh, quarterly training is what we did and that seemed to work and continues to work really well. Uh, quarterly we do drills and every time we drill personal protective equipment is part of that drill. So I think you know our staff have just come to know that they walk in and that's the first thing that we do. Um, and then we do an annual competency as well which I'll spend a little bit more time on that. Also thinking about then when you pull these individuals to uh, join and participate in your team for those periods of time that you may need them, what is your backfill plan? from a leadership perspective in your organization. So for nine years, that wasn't a risk for our managers in our organization as some of the team joined our, our group. And uh, it was kind of not really comical, but um, I think you know everybody thought, well, that's never gonna happen. And then all of a sudden it was happening back to back to back. So just from a nursing leadership perspective, needing to make sure that you have a plan for backfill. Then you know special project teams might be important too. So we uh, thought we had you know, a lot of things figured out related to lab, and we had this conversation the last couple days with many of you as well. But really, until kind of you have that defining moment, you really probably have not spent the amount of time you need to in negotiating some of those more um, 
fine-tuned uh, situational things related to what is your menu of tests that you're willing to do that you can do safely from a risk perspective. So having those conversations as early as you can uh, certainly pays off. But this, that was a team we had to put together even though we thought we had a plan. Um, there was a lot of concern and so it was kind of back to really getting into the weeds then on uh, doing a risk assessment in our lab and then really collaborating uh, with the key leaders and, and team players in those uh, departments. We had several uh, small groups that we convened um, with infection control practitioners. Um, I remember with emergency management folks on evacuation plans and things. So you'll have many small group project things that are probably within this operations section that would be applied. Then the thing that we none, none of us ever want to think about, but in a pandemic, what is your morgue plan? Most hospitals these days only have a few spots. Um, so what does one do? And um, I'm assuming you all have a pretty uh, robust uh, coalition, so that might be something to really work through, and perhaps you've already done that as a healthcare coalition within this community, is really thought through collaboratively. How are you going to manage through the um, multiple deaths and and all of that kind of thing that could happen from a pandemic. And then when you think about from a uh, case of Ebola, um, and I've got a couple slides in here on care of the deceased, but that also has to be a pre-thought through plan. And again, collaborating with your, your public health folks on um, cremation order and some of those kind of things in advance so that that isn't something that would be a surprise and you'd have to work through. We talked about lab plans. And then behavioral health. In any sort of incident, behavioral health is critical. So we found that behavioral health support for our team was uh, very, very important. And we had an individual that just sort of immersed themselves with our team. So in our unit, we have a cold, um, warm, and a hot zone. And so uh, our team player person uh, has always done uh, psych first aid courses. Um, which some of our staff have attended, and she uh, also works with Red Cross and has been deployed to many uh, kind of disaster situations. So she was really, really helpful in listening to some of our staff who perhaps were disinvited to birthday parties or um, holiday events, and really uh, we worked hard to uh, change a shift from a nursing leadership perspective to spend time with staff, um, really understanding what it is they were going through. Um, out in the real world uh, once they uh, went home after their shift every day. So your planning division then, this is the group that oversees kind of pulling together data that might be important, analyzing important information, developing alternatives to perhaps some tactical plans that you might have in place, and really kind of helping that incident commander with what is that defining period uh, and coming up with goals to achieve during those periods. So some things that I kind of thought through would be nice fits under this uh, planning group is um, the whole issue of your screening tool development, you know, from the entry areas at the beginning of something, and Dr. Bell talked a lot about travel history. We need to make sure that as we move forward, and even though it's less about West Africa and some of those things at this point, those are all very important things for a lot of the emerging infectious diseases that are going uh, to occur, is that travel history can really help that clinician and really help you to mil mitigate at the front doors of uh, your entry gates to assure that you're taking every step that you can. So it's no different than really just thinking about your influenza season and how you're really throwing the masks on at the beginning of uh, every uh, step in your process, whether that's in your ER, in your clinics, or, or wherever that might be. So always just taking that next step to try to think through the controls and how you can mitigate um, as early as possible. We also um, think about emergency plans during these sorts of things. And I always thought that um, Fires were pretty non-possible, I don't know the, the word I'm trying to think of here. But um, in 2011, we had a fluoroscopy uh, unit in radiology that created an electrical fire. I've never seen so much smoke in my whole life. And so really thinking about 
if you have a group of infectious disease patients, where are you going with them? So if you do have smoke or you do have an emergency of some sort in that space, where can you be going with them? Always having a plan and always thinking about what are all the what ifs in advance that you can think through, work with your team to make sure that they're prepared for. And we had a tornado watch, of course, during our care of our first patient. Of course we did. So um, really just, uh, uh, again, are you defending in place or you know, where can you evacuate that would be away from other uh, patients and um, do you uh, use an isopod, do you put PPE on them? So really just kind of having all those plans thought through in advance. One of the, uh, I guess not an aha kind of thing, uh, we pretty much expected there would be individuals, unfortunately, who uh, looked into medical records. And we did, and I know Emory did as well, had to uh, dismiss a few of our employees. Not our biocontainment employees, but other employees in the hospital who just thought that, you know, for some reason they thought they could just go ahead and take a look at these patients' records. So even though we preemptively, you know, reminded people of HIPAA responsibilities and all of that, you're still going to have a situation where you need to make sure that you're constantly auditing uh, for those sorts of things because our patients deserve that privacy. Dr. Bell mentioned the robust occupational health. I uh, can't speak enough about how labor intensive monitoring temperatures twice a day with no system or infrastructure uh, was. So I think we all had different experiences. At Emory, they had a very robust occupational health uh, team who had case management who kind of took different numbers of employees and kind of followed up and validated uh, them. Uh, whereas at Nebraska, that kind of fell to us um, and the nursing leaders on the unit. So um, we started off with this uh, log sheet and quickly then moved to an Excel spreadsheet, which wasn't a whole lot better. Um, and then uh, move towards getting our IT resources involved to create uh, an internal homegrown system with some uh, alerts built in because that was a lot to keep an eye on the temps of everybody twice a day. Even though we knew that if one of our staff had a fever, they were going to raise the flag very quickly. And in fact, we had a policy to that regard, so they all knew their accountability in relationship to um, assuring that we had a process for that to occur. So other things that might fit within the planning section of a command structure for something like this would be any HR issues requiring resolution. And then this is also where we uh, kind of focused our efforts for caring for the family. And so we had kind of a nurse liaison person who kind of took charge of really working with our families to make sure that they had their needs met. They were all from different parts of uh, the United States, away from family members, and so really kind of helped give them some guidance and, and support during that time as well. And then, as we talked about screening, uh, we all have developed different screening tools, whether that's uh, paper um, or built into the electronic healthcare record. I saw quite a few uh, examples yesterday and the day before of building that into the electronic healthcare record, which is awesome. Um, some people won't have those resources to get that done, so really thinking about how do you um, remove as much of the human element as possible so that you can provide alerts when things you know, should raise red flags. And um, I think in this day of technology, we're really moving forward in a, a significant way as far as uh, more global uh, travel screening and how we can utilize that information. Logistics had a lot of work in their uh, sections. So uh, they're obviously responsible to organize things. Uh, they've got maintenance accountability for the physical environment materials, um, supplies, and other support activities. So this would be where waste management would fit, um, making sure you have a robust plan for that. And I know Dr. Lowe is going to speak about that in a little bit, so I'm going to kind of avoid that. Um, facilities plan, making sure that you've got your uh, negative pressure units and your testing that needs to be done on a daily fashion with that when you've got your um, rooms activated. Uh, what's your procedures and, and plans for if some sort of a facility emergency would occur while you've got patients in that space? 
So again, just really talking through all that uh, in advance. What's your security plan? And how are you gonna organize uh, your security resources around uh, your physical space? How are you going to um, manage uh, when you've got people coming into your organization? Uh, Biomed. So uh, if you have an autoclave, then obviously there's some, some things there to mitigate from a standpoint of um, business continuity and assuring that you have uh, systems that work. Um, but certainly a lot of other equipment, whether that's uh, medical equipment or um, other sort of facilities equipment. PPE management. So making sure that you have enough on hand to be able to care for uh, a person for uh, up to five days is kind of the plan on a national perspective for assessment hospitals. But I think we talked over the last couple days that really probably you all, since you're kind of isolated here, um, to some extent, you definitely need to be thinking about longer than that because who knows, you know, with weather and all sorts of things, it's always better to have a, a little bit of additional capacity in that regard. And then you can always count on back orders and, and things like that. So could you identify your PPE and then maybe what's an alternative that you'd be willing to go to that wouldn't take a lot of additional uh, work to uh, bring team members up to speed on that? Linens, food plan, um, certainly in a pandemic type situation. So I'm just trying to make this a little bit broader today um, than just Ebola. But um, how many days of food on hand does your organization have? So if you had a pandemic and really a lot of the businesses and other things would be disrupted, uh, what you know, would be your capability to uh, keep going with uh, feeding your staff and feeding your uh, patients, knowing that you had an influx of uh, people coming at you for care as well. So just thinking through some of those things. And then supplies and medication lists. Um, supplies, uh, as we all know, are, are pretty, uh, routine things and uh, certainly with supply chain being what it is, kind of in a just-in-time fashion, in some regards, uh, those things need to be thought through as well. And then finance, I probably can't say enough about this. Um, it's like the last thing you think about, but it's huge. Um, so certainly, too, we all know in the uh, incident command and emergency management world that if you don't document things and you don't have good records, uh, even if there was federal funding that came forward, um, would you be able to go after it by having good records? So in the HICS structure, there's lots of different forms and tools that can be used, um, and those are at the bottom of your job action sheets, of course. But one of the things we learned with um, care of uh, our patients with Ebola virus disease was, and even with our training and uh, operations over the last 10 years, we had a single cost center that really allowed us to keep track of what it was that we were spending from a standpoint of PPE and our training costs for our staff to come in uh, quarterly. And um, it certainly served us well then when we actually had a patient. We could just kind of push all of the costs related to everything we were doing there, and it really helped us to better understand what was the overall amount and um, how could we uh, keep on top of what that was going to look like. The other thing is uh, there's obviously no uh, charge structures that exist for this. Um, so your general ICU rate won't come close uh, to really what your costs are going to be related to that. I think when I backed into our costs, it was roughly $30,000 per day was what it cost us. And obviously, that'll be different for other people. Um, because, again, I go back to what's the acuity of your patient, what's your geographic location that's going to drive your staffing strategy, um, and lots of different variables that play a part. What's the price of some of your additional supplies you're trying to get in? Uh, security has a cost. Um, just, you know, if you really back in all of those sorts of things, waste management, uh, it really begins to add up. So over the years, and um, I was very impressed over the last couple of days as we traveled everywhere that there was a lot of uh, leadership engagement. So I think that that is essential uh, to really keeping momentum, sustaining readiness, driving home the importance of training, is to really have key leaders who have an accountability 
for um, assuring that things are in place and that thing, drills get done and that the PPE that you need is here and really uh, being that steward of uh, making sure uh, things happen. So we actually, within our team, so I had a kind of administrative accountability and for hiring and really assuring that the logistics of the unit got done. Uh, Dr. Lowe was in charge of transport and waste management and a lot of other kind of miscellaneous things. Uh, we had a physician, our vice chancellor, in charge of our FDA and kind of experimental medications. We had two other nurses who were really accountable for the down and in training and drills and things like that. And um, it hasn't always been uh, this robust. We used to meet once a month as a leadership team. And I had a nurse leader who uh, had just like a 0.2 FTE. And that was so that she could work one day a week working on making sure that the drills got done, that they were, um, that, sh that staff got the competency testing that they needed to get done, that, um, you know, just all of those little logistics that go into making sure that you're ready. So um, I just can't say enough about how important it is to have a physician leader as well who's going to partner with nursing um, to assure and have the other kind of team members that will step up and be a part of that, that leadership group. So um, like I said, over the last couple days, we certainly saw that at many of your organizations. So hopefully we can continue to uh, have that kind of model uh, pushing forward. And then... Um, I'd like to talk just for a couple minutes about the staffing of the unit. So I'm kind of bringing closure to the Hicks structure, and now we'll talk a little bit more about different um, operational things within our unit. So um, this is another uh, challenge I know for many. So we have differing models across the country, uh, of which some are joining teams in a very voluntary fashion. And in some cases, whether that's a union or other, then um, there's more of kind of others having, um, being assigned. So, and we even, between Emory, New York, and um, Nebraska have a little bit different models. So they're all, they're all right. Um, it's just really trying to figure out how you navigate amongst that uh, to really come up with what's the best model for you. So I'll speak about um, our model at Nebraska. So they're all voluntary, and they actually apply to be on this uh, team. And that's been that way for the 10 years. So typically when a nurse or a respiratory therapist or a patient care tech, we have all three in our care model, as they apply, they put in an application, and then they meet with myself and one of the other nursing uh, leaders to really kind of talk through a few behavioral interviewing questions about teamwork and kind of what motivated them to want to join the team. And invariably, what we've found is that these are individuals who truly want to stretch themselves and who want to um, kind of do that next thing to kind of expand their, their knowledge base in their career. Um, so. Once that's done and we feel like they'd be a really good fit, then we reach back out to their uh, clinical manager because I want to make sure that they're somebody who's got good clinical skills because when they join this team, I'm not going to teach them to be a nurse. We're going to teach them to do the things that they would do as a nurse in this full personal protective equipment gear. Um, so invariably what I've been able to find is that these individuals who kind of preference to be on this team are typically really good clinical experts. I also asked their, their leader about their uh, flexibility, their adaptability, their resilience kind of um, in various uh, situational things. And so that's really kind of how we have built our team. So our team includes a diverse mix of nurses. So I have about 50% of the nurses are ICU trained. And then I have some med surge telemetry nurses, as well as I have a couple operating room nurses. Um, an infusion nurse, uh, one that works in interventional radiology, so a really uh, diverse mix of folks. And then um, six respiratory therapists and five patient care technicians who um, serve as donning doffing partner, but they also helped with our waste management and running our autoclave. So um, these folks uh, are just, have just been um, phenomenal, and I think, you know, perhaps even that additional kind of expertise in those other realms, um, perhaps in certain situations really added to the kind of critical thinking and um, ability to work through some kind of complex things. 
So the other thing that we've done is added, um, because we're both a pediatric and an adult uh, unit, we added uh, another 10 nurses who are um, pediatric trained, so five are general peds and five are uh, pediatric intensive care. And so our model is that if we activated for a pediatric patient, because um, we wouldn't have necessarily enough pediatric expertise to be fully uh, covering just with pediatric staff, is that we would partner them with one of our biocontainment unit core staff um, so that we always had that peds expertise and uh, hands-on capability, but we could also augment with um, other care members to be able to help uh, provide information and uh, support for that um, provision of care. So our staff, I mentioned what the makeup of them is, and then we certainly have um, lots of different uh, core support staff that join them. Our physicians are predominantly infectious disease, but we have critical care intensivists, most of whom are uh, anesthesiologists. But we also have um, a nephrologist uh, who joined and works with our group. Um, and I'm trying to think of the rest. But um, most all of our staff are just the ones that uh, do everything within the unit. Uh, radiology, actually, uh, the tech comes into the unit and has been trained in PPE, but they just run their machine. They don't position the patient. Our staff does all that. Um, so that's worked out pretty well. Same thing with EKG if we needed that. So let me head into a few minutes on education, drills, and training. So as far as nurse competencies, we ask them to make sure that uh, they do all of their basic competencies on their home unit. So whatever the ICU competencies are, whatever, you know, competencies are in their, their, their own home unit. And then when they come to us, they do competencies on uh, autoclave because that's unique and different. And they do a competency on personal protective equipment. And then I think we have a couple other uh, ones, um, especially skill station kind of things that they do. So the way that we organize, I said we do quarterly drills, but we also on occasion will have a staff meeting. And we'll also, we've started to do some kind of creative things via email. So we'll send out an article electronically and then ask a couple questions. And so then staff can kind of engage back on those questions in a collaborative manner. Every time that we do a quarterly drill, we, um, as I mentioned, do personal protective equipment. And the drills are really a combination of, uh, we did a tabletop drill prior to doing our 10 uh, MERS patient uh, functional drill. And then we um, also perhaps might do skill stations. Uh, so just kind of keeping it fresh and different every time. But like I mentioned, personal protective equipment is certainly on every uh, drill that we do. And then we drill for all ages. So these are just pictures from some of our drills. And we drill in both the high-level PPE as well as our PAPRs. And then just to touch base on pediatrics for a few minutes, I know we've got some folks in here that um, will be also uh, standing up as an assessment center to help with pediatrics. And of course, this looks very familiar, I'm sure, um, the crash cart and the Breslow. And the way that we've organized uh, some of our um, pediatric stuff is because we aren't going to stock all of this in the unit. And that's one of the things we've done to really keep our costs down. So again, it's really thinking about how can you come up with your checklists and tools so that if you need something in that uh, just-in-time kind of fashion uh, to be able to deploy to your space or whatever, just having those tools and information in advance uh, is going to be very helpful. This is an example of an age-specific supply list that we have. So we have different categories of ages. So this is a zero to one year of age. Here are the things that we need. Um, so we'll be able to share these with you too, uh, if that would be helpful. Um, so it's just really thinking about all this in advance and, and having these tools so that you have the just-in-time information that you need. Because one of the things that you're sustaining over a long period of time, we need to really be mindful of our financial considerations, right? So um, because the resources are limited 
and we will have things outdating if we aren't managing our supplies in a way that, that, that's responsible. So the other thing from an education drill and training perspective is uh, we have lots of different scenarios. And on NewTech.org, uh, we'll be pushing out quite a few uh, drills in the upcoming months. Uh, we've got one out there now, which is a healthcare coalition drill. It's a tabletop. But our goal is to really help you all with that as well so you aren't starting from scratch on um, some of these drills. So you'll be able to download them and just kind of customize them as you wish. Um, so even if you just look in the, the one picture in the far upper left there, uh, we actually had a functional drill on how to drape the uh, diagnostic uh, x-ray machine and how we do an x-ray on a patient. So it can be that simple and that straightforward. And maybe you have two or three of those that you would do um, as a part of your drill. So it's just doing one sort of functional thing um, or task that you would uh, focus on. The other uh, in the lower right is provider down. So we recently did a provider down drill and we learned a lot. So you've got somebody who's in the hot zone and all of a sudden has a syncopal episode or something like that. How do you safely, quickly get them out of that space, get them out of their personal protective equipment and get them to where they can get the additional uh, care that they need? So again, that's a protocol that we've developed and it's readily available for you all to utilize as well. Um, so again, it's just kind of thinking through what are all those different scenarios that might happen. We've done a lot of collaboration and I think John will spend, Dr. Lowe will spend um, some time talking about transport, so I'll leave that as is. I also wanted to just mention that Persons under investigation, as we've kind of seen things evolve with Ebola and, and most likely with uh, MERS as well, a lot of those folks will probably rule out instead of ruling in. So we have to think about how do we continue to provide emerging care, urgent care to these folks under investigation. So one of the drills that we did was with a group of our general surgeons, uh, trauma surgeons, uh, we actually took a person under investigation to the operating room. So we decided what's the operating room we're going to use, how do you uh, mitigate the positive pressure that's in a uh, operating room, how do you think about handing instruments. So our plan was to use the neutral zone with the basin on the, the field so that the scrub person puts the instrument in the basin, the surgeon picks it up themselves. Are you going to do it laparoscopically or open? Uh, how are you going to manage your instruments after that? Where are you going to recover the patient? Um, lots of different things that you can learn by working through an exercise like that. Um, so really, again, trying to think through that in advance and, you know, how, what PPE are you going to wear and putting a um, sterile gown over top of that and a sterile pair of gloves over top of your other gear. So all of those things, you know, you, you don't want in the moment of crisis to be having the surgeon do that for the first time. So whatever you can do in advance to kind of work through those things will, will be definitely well served. I talked briefly about readiness strategies. So over these 10 years, we've got this unit that um, has been used for a lot of other things. So we've used it as a surge space for additional uh, patients. We've used it as a clinic during a construction project. We used it for um, annual competency training for respiratory therapists for our whole organization used the space. We used it for testing our electronic healthcare records for device integration when we went live with our EPIC uh, information system, and then certainly tours and other things. So how do you use the space and make sure that you're continuing to um, not just have it be idle, but have it be useful? Uh, Just-in-time checklists, and this is one of the things that we have out on the NeTech.org website, and I know that Emory's is out there as well. And it's really just a tool that you can customize to your organization who are all the people you need to notify when you have a person under investigation arrive that meets the case definition? You don't want to have to rethink all that every time. So if you can develop a tool in advance, is your space already outfitted with the medications and supplies it needs? Or is that something you should create a list for so that you aren't trying to think of all that 
in that moment um, and be able to uh, populate then your shelves and your, your medication uh, dispensing unit or whatever it is that you have in your spaces um, to be able to fit the needs of your patient population. So given that we didn't have any funding over the last <laughs> 10 years to really keep this unit, I had to really think how I could creatively uh, continue to keep people prepared but not spend any money. And that's kind of hard. <laughs> so um, we had just a small amount that was allocated towards just paying our staff when they came to drill quarterly. So coming up with kind of creative things that you can do to, to make it as efficient as possible. PPE I won't spend much time on either because I know uh, Dr. Lowe and others have, have done that. Um, these are the two types of personal protective equipment that we wear, and um, both are correct. And uh, again, it really depends on kind of what's available to you and what your staff are most comfortable with, and making sure that um, you practice and prepare accordingly uh, with that. Uh, tools, 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 and really no hierarchy. When I think about uh, the team and how we functioned during care of patients with known Ebola virus. Uh, it, it was just, I don't know how to describe the kind of high reliability and, and accountability that everybody felt. Um, so many of our physicians were very clear about the fact, just tell me what to do when we're doffing. You know, walk me through this. We had flip charts on the wall with our doffing sequence. Um, everybody was watching everybody's back. And I think about, boy, if we could apply that generally in healthcare, <laughs> wouldn't that be great? Um, and what could we really do from a healthcare acquired infection uh, standpoint to really mitigate and reduce uh, things across the board? It's, it's really creating that culture of, of assurance and accountability for lots of things. Um, we do an annual competency assessment with PPE, but then again, we drill every time with PPE on a quarterly basis. And so we formally check people off and make sure they understand the rationale for different things and that they can uh, follow the steps. Um, uh, this is just an example of uh, the space that we used for our donning, uh, all of our PPE. And then doffing PPE, we chose a little different model, and again, they're all correct. So our doffing partner is an active doffing partner. So our doffing partner always had the same level of PPE on uh, that the caregivers in the patient care room had on. So uh, you can see right there, we're untying their gown in the back, um, helping them to remove their shoe covers and things like that. Because after a three to four hour shift in the room, uh, pretty intense uh, time, uh, staff are tired. Um, so we found that really this active model uh, worked really well for us. And again, that's gonna be different for uh, different people and they're both right. Um, it's just making sure that you have uh, the structures in place to assure that you have um, the safe process. Staff engagement, uh, I think the way that we worked really hard to maintain staff engagement over all the years, and we've had people come, people go, people move to different roles. Um, they travel with uh, their significant others to do fellowships elsewhere, um, or they come to Hawaii like Will, but um, we uh, really have a shared governance model and uh, really feel strongly in, you know, you give the staff a problem or a situation and they're the ones that can come up with the best protocol. It's just uh, been proven to us time and time and time again and it really, I think, uh, encourages their um, critical thinking but also it really gives them ownership and accountability for uh, the standard operating procedure. Um, over the time, we have tweaked and changed and uh, adjusted our protocols many times and much of that is learned through our drills. And it's just a matter of having a really agile group that can um, come together, figure it out, make the edits, and then it's just kind of that plan, practice, learn, adapt, and just that whole cycle. So we have many standard operating procedures. And again, those are available to anybody who would like to download them and use um, as you wish and customize on our needtech.org website, as well as Emory's are there as well. Um, communication was something that was really important to us during activation. Uh, 
we, uh, I'm an early bird, so I would come in about six in the morning, touch base with the night shift, and greet the day shift, kind of see how everything went from the night before, and talk about if there was anything new or different that we'd edited or adjusted the day before with the oncoming shift. And then uh, Kate did the same thing on uh, the 7 p.m. rotation. And we always sent out a little quick update every day because all staff doesn't work every day, right? So if we changed a little something or um, something unique occurred, then that would be their one-time touch point uh, for the day to kind of understand what went on. We had some fun stuff in there as well as just uh, little things that we might have done or cha changed or tweaked. This is just an example of a standard operating procedure. Um, this is our spill cleanup and how we would work through those processes. And again, this isn't something that you want to um, probably work on in the moment because uh, this, this is something that you wanna make sure that there's been some uh, practice with and uh, there's certainly some things that make it work better or not. Um, again, it's about your space, it's about your supplies, it's about um, really having the staff think through whether or not this is gonna work for them and uh, kind of owning that. So that's just one example. And I won't spend too much time on deceased management because I know Dr. Lowe's gonna touch base on that. I will just say that um, this was a very rigorous uh, process that we went through. I think some of the, the human elements to it, we use um, a system of uh, HIPAA compliant telemedicine uh, communication, so it's like FaceTime, but it, it, it's, like I said, HIPAA compliant. So we re really very much allowed the family of our patient who died to be involved in his cares at the end. Our staff provided him with last rites and um, really did all of the things that um, we would do for any other patient in the organization. And I think that they really felt a lot of uh, involvement in his care at the end, even though they weren't in the room with him. Um, so. Uh, I will just say that, that this was a process that, um, not the human element process, but really the procedure for how do you handle um, a deceased uh, body of somebody with a highly infectious disease. So um, we learned a lot through that, but we also had that well established in advance. Um, and you'll see on the next slide, uh, really making sure that you have a plan for how are you gonna document. Uh, so date of birth, date of death, name because you're never opening that bag again, you know? So, uh, and if, especially in a, in a difficult situation with a lot of patients, we need to think about what is the identity in the chain of custody that you can provide to assure that, that you're properly identifying individuals. And then Dr. Lowe will talk about um, how we processed uh, the body out. Um, and I think the, the neat part was we were able to um, go with uh, the body for cremation and bring uh, the ashes back uh, and provide to his wife to take home on the plane that afternoon. So, and thinking back to about behavioral health care uh, for staff, we had a um, memorial service, which was really, really important for staff and our physicians to be involved in and to really debrief um, about uh, the care because that, that's a very intense, it doesn't matter where people are at, when, um, you know, in that death process, it's always difficult, but really thinking about even from an incident command standpoint, how do you debrief um, each one of your drills and really think about what are the action items that you can make edits and change and, and adapt going forward. So to kind of finish up, uh, lessons learned during our activation, uh, incident command was really important. Bricks and mortar may need adjustment, and I think we found that over the last couple of days, too, as we kind of talked about your workflow paths and what we might be able to, to think about doing differently to kind of um, assure kind of that clean and dirty uh, route. Daily briefings, we had that command group uh, doing the daily briefings, so we knew exactly how much PPE we had on hand. We knew if there were any facility issues. We knew the experimental drugs. We knew what our PIO was going to uh, share for the day, so really using that command structure. Uh, problem solving was constant. Backfilling of staff was uh, difficult. Uh, leadership matters. We really know cost structures existed. The temperature management was difficult. <laughs> I think I've probably said that enough, but. 
Um, unanticipated rewards, the formation of a cohesive team who can trust each other with their lives uh, was really one of those outcomes that, you know, was kind of the wow moment of really trusting each other to the fullest. Empowerment of your staff to really adapt and implement new things in innovative ways. Um, that we provided care for three patients infected with the Ebola virus disease with absolutely no staff exposures and that we're having the opportunity now to provide education and training to colleagues from around the world and really providing a once in a lifetime experience for many nurses and, and other staff. So two slides on, that was then and this is now. Of course, we've all read about MERS. So um, again, this goes back to really tools and checklists and do you have tools that at two in the morning your ED charge nurse knows what to do uh, if you have somebody present who perhaps meets the case definition of uh, a different emerging pathogen. So really you can take this kind of model, and again, it's out there on needtech.org, and really apply it to anything that comes your way. Uh, the health department's phone numbers are on here. What room are you going to take them to? Maybe you've got a fill-in charge nurse that night. Um, what's each person's responsibility? How are you going to uh, draw lab work? I shared this with the team yesterday. Um, even doing a nasopharyngeal swab seems like it should be pretty straightforward for ER staff, but we all have people that turn over. And so one of the tools that we've created is a, a laboratory tool for, for MERS. So what is it that our lab needs to be able to draw? And then there's a link with a 30 second video about how to do a nasopharyngeal swab. So it's just that quick, just in time for that ER nurse to just make sure or whoever uh, would be doing that um, swab. And then think about what's different. What's different about MERS from a screening perspective, from your PUI spaces and your physical things? What's different from a laboratory standpoint? Big difference is, is you're going to know if they have MERS or not in a few hours versus days. That's kind of nice. Um, PPE considerations. Waste management would be very different. Your healthcare worker monitoring is going to be 14 days, and some other nuances related to that. So, two more slides here nationally. Uh, this is a slide that you've probably all seen about frontline hospitals and kind of what their accountabilities are. Many of you here today are, are, are definitely the uh, Ebola assessment hospitals, and so you're really accountable for that five day uh, care strategy and then Ebola treatment centers, which I know your region nine is yet to be named, but hopefully uh, soon will be forthcoming for region nine. This is a picture of the national map, and it has uh, the 10 regions for the country, and then um, the other dots are basically state-defined Ebola treatment centers uh, for different places, and obviously that's different based upon where you're at with population. And then with that, questions. Any questions? Well, I just want to thank Shelley for um, guiding us. That was probably the gentlest guide through instant command that I've, <laughs> and the most logical <laughs> guide through instant command structure I've ever heard. And so I think it was very good. Um, I don't know about you all, but I found it informative. Um, and also just to review go, that it, how important it is to go through the what ifs, that it's not always just about what's in front of you. And I think we all sometimes tend to think about Ebola, oh my God, and then it's this explosion of like, we have to focus on this and this and this. And, and we forget that it could be the simple things that stumble us. Um, and also that we could also, just like you had a tornado bearing down on you potentially, we could have hurricane. We just had a wonderfully busy, El Nino season, so you know, it could just very well be something like that. So just keeping all those things in mind.